This is Hannibal from TheHannibalTV.com, and we usually do uh, professional wrestling and MMA-related interviews, but we have done some UFO-related interviews, and today is going to be another UFO-related interview, because on the line we have the author of the Pascagoula, The Closest Encounter, My Story, by Calvin Parker, which is available on Amazon now, but uh, we have Calvin Parker himself on the line who discusses in this book an alien abduction incident that occurred with him and one of his friends in 1973 in uh, Pascagoula, Mississippi. How are you tonight, Mr. Parker? I'm great. How are y'all? I'm doing well. I was actually uh, in Mississippi uh, back in October um, conducting a wrestling interview and I find that sometimes when uh, mainstream media makes fun of abduction incidents, um, they all, they sometimes make fun of, of the fact that sometimes they take place in uh, secluded places. But when I was driving through Mississippi, it is very rural and very secluded, so I could see how something like that could happen there and it wouldn't be a mass sighting. Right. You know, it was some eyewitnesses to it, and that's all accounted for in the book. And the eyewitness accounts came out later because I guess uh, originally you guys didn't want this story to go public because you were about to get married and you were only 19, and you didn't want to get, have this reputation. Um, and then you ended up moving and... Now it's many decades later that you finally have come out with this book, I guess, just to get everything documented. Yeah, what it was, uh, when I when I would give an interview with the media or the media would track me down and say they had an interview with me, then it would somehow end up getting changed. And I didn't like that. If you're going to uh, do an interview with someone, you do it just raw and you let them... Uh, you don't change what they say. So I was having a, a problem with that. And I actually wasn't going to write a book, but uh, Philip Mantle with a flying disc press, he uh, said, well, look, Kevin, if you do it or write a book, it's documented. That's your words, that's your legacy. And they can't go in there and change it on you. All you got to do is tell them to read the book. And I guess when this took place in 1973, I, from what I understand, it was national news. And it was the first real big alien abduction story that ever came out. Is that about correct? Oh, was it national news? Of course, in 73, you don't have the social media or you didn't have cell phones. And I guess word of mouth traveled faster than anything. But uh, when this happened, we were at the sheriff department, and, and this is the only way I could figure out that it leaked. The sheriff department brought us in, interrogated us, put us in a room together. And then the next morning, we got up and went to work, and we asked them not to say nothing to nobody. But when we got to work, it was just storms of media there. And the only way I could figure out is maybe somebody at the sheriff's department leaked it, or during the 70s, the scanners was real bad, where they would uh, scan the uh, sheriff's department radios and police radios and all that. And everybody and their brother had one, and somebody might have heard it and leaked it out like that. Even the press had scanners, so uh, that could be a very well how it got leaked. And since you've written your book, I know you've been on, I think, Fox and a, a few other major uh, television shows, haven't you? Could you name some of the television shows you've been on for, for news for this? I could. One's Fox News. Then I've been on uh, all the local news stations here on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And then I was on ITV out of the UK. And from what I understand, they have millions of viewers and uh it's several more it's hard to remember them but 
every night since the book's released, I've been on some kind of program, and it's just about wore me down. I can imagine, because I guess if you were, uh, I'm not a great mathematician, but how old are you now if you were 19 in 1973? 64. 64 years old, okay. Yes, sir. And the other gentleman that was with you has since passed on? He has. I I think he did. I never really kept up with him, but about seven years ago. Oh, and I'm going to do a a show this coming Thursday with a travel channel, so I got a flight flying out of here before too long, you know, going to Austin, Texas, and I'll be over there for a few days with a travel channel. Okay, well, I just wanted to establish for people that haven't heard about your story in your book that how major a story this was, but could you actually uh, get into the situation? I understand you were a fisherman and you had just finished a day's work and you were fishing when all of this occurred? Yes, sir, that's true. We got off work, uh, it was October 11th, 1973, and for an October day, it was probably 90 degrees that day. So we had got off work and decided to go fishing to kind of uh, relax a little bit before we went home. So we uh, picked our fishing equipment up and went to a place in Pascagoula. It was no abandoned shipyard, the Shaw Peter Shipyard. And uh, pulled up and parked, and it was... Uh, as far as getting there, it was hard to get there. You had to go around the world in order to get to this place. And when we got there, I noticed I never had been there before. And I told Charlie, I said, you know, they need to pick this place up. There's all kind of trash here. And he said, well, where the flood water comes in, it brings the trash in. And then it goes out. And he said, this has been abandoned for a while. And it's just left the debris here. So it took us probably to walk to the river at least a good 15 minutes. And we was sitting on the east bank of the Pasquagilla River, and I was facing a a Coast Guard ship, or sitting there looking at a Coast Guard ship, and in the back of my mind I was wondering, how how does something made made out of steel float? And... That's when I noticed some blue hazy lights flashing from behind us. And I was thinking now, Charlie then got me in trouble. We own private property down here. And uh, they come to lock us up up or put us in jail or run us off. And I wish that had been the case. As I stood up and turned around and Charlie turned around about the same time I did, there was a craft, a, a large craft you couldn't tell the color because it was blue lights hazy blue lights flashing from it and then all of a sudden it just one big bright light just over flooded us where we were and what I figured that was was probably the door on the craft that opened up and it took just a few seconds uh, to get to where we could see there because of that bright light and by the how, time how we big got was this we, craft? Um, just I, I want to say it was probably 80 foot long and 8, 10 foot high at the doors. Uh, it's really hard to tell how big it was because we was really blinded by the lights. And, and you were in shock by, too, I imagine. Oh, shoot, yeah. And by the time we these beings that floated out of the craft and picked us up. Two of them got a hold of Charlie and one got a hold of myself. And I immediately felt an injection in my arm. And that kind of settled me down, but it paralyzed me. I I couldn't turn my head or nothing, you know, look to my left or right, but I could see everything straight in front of me. And I was conscious of the noises and the smells and everything that was going on. So he took us to the uh, when they floated us. out how how high were they off the ground would you say I'd say approximately two foot okay do you think it was the suits that they may have been wearing that would have allowed them to float or do you think they could have just you know, had the ability to float I've thought about that a lot and it's 
you know, they had to have somehow to float wherever it was on. But I didn't hear any noise coming out of their suits or anything like that. So, you know, I'm really not, un I'm, I'm really unsure about all this. But I, I do know one thing. When they grabbed me by the arm, I automatically lifted up to the same level they were, and it wasn't any pain. So it could be something magnetic or something like that that floated us up. And what did but they look like? Just, what did they look like exactly, uh, the ones that came to get you when uh, they came to bring you inside the craft? Well, they was probably four, four or five foot tall. They didn't have a neck. They was built real husky looking and uh, had long arms. And they, I, they looked like they had mittens on or crab-like hands, but they had gray metallic skin, kind of like an elephant. And that's the best way to describe the skin. It was kind of wrinkled and like an elephant. So the skin was showing, like what kind of, what, what was the suit covering? Was it like clothes for us or was it? Uh, no, I'm not for sure that they even had clothes on. Okay. Actually, the more I think about what I've seen on them, the ones that picked us up, they had robotic moves and, you know, kind of mechanical. When they moved, they kind of uh, did it in certain motions and, and it just made me think it was kind of like a robot and taking commands from somewhere else. And then that would make more sense as I got on the inside. You know, there was more of a feminine looking creature that uh, did the examination and all on us. But, uh, and you couldn't run away, I guess, because you were surrounded by water and the craft was in front of you. And by the time they came out, I guess. You couldn't move, I guess? You, uh, you, you felt paralyzed? No, sir. You, you couldn't. Because I did think about running. Cause I kind of looked to the left and looked to the right. There was water on both sides, water in the front. And uh, I was a strong swimmer and all, but there was so much debris in that water where they had worked on them ships, you know, and it was kind of jagged-looking metals and everything else in there. So I didn't want to take a chance of doing that. And uh, I was thinking, you know, it, then the, it happened so fast, you really couldn't think. They was just on us and picked us up and took us aboard that little craft. So when, uh, what, what's going through your head as you're, as you're being brought to, aboard this craft? Actually, at the moment, I was thinking uh, the Engel shipyard, which works on... Uh, ships for the military and experimental projects. Now they got a drone program going on. I was thinking to myself, there's some of them big rednecks up there out for a joy ride and they just figured they'd pull a joke on us and this all be over in a minute. But uh, it went a lot further than that. Uh, it actually went into like a crime mode. If, this had been done by a human, it would be a crime. The police would investigate it and, and call it a, uh, like a home invasion or an invasion or something of that sort. I believe they even have, isn't abduction a crime? You can abduct somebody, can't you? No, sir, you can't. It's, it's a solid crime. Okay. If I was sitting on my couch in here and somebody busted the door down and uh, drug me out to their van, it did that. I mean, that's that's a lifetime crime right there. I mean, they'd go to the pen a long time here in the states for that. Yeah. So you're being brought inside this this craft. What what do you see once you go inside? The first thing I did, of course, my eyes was fixed straight in front of me, and I didn't have no control where I could turn. But the first thing I wanted to see is why was these lights so bright and where were they coming from? But the lights seemed to be coming out of the wall in the craft. It just kind of illuminated out, kind of like if you painted a room with lights and you opened the door and they just shined. So I looked and the lights was bright and we made an immediate left. Now I've lost track of where Charlie is or what he was doing at this time, really didn't care at this time. So we made a left, and then he made a right. 
and he took me into a little room and laid me on a table at about a 45 degree angle and uh, he backed up out of the way. That's when the other beam come in. Now this other one, I believe I could have took it or her. I call it a her for some reason. But if I could have had all my senses about me, I believe I could have grabbed her and run out the door and had evidence that day. So she but, uh, wasn't a robot. Like she was less robotic than the other ones. Right. She uh. She had normal fingers. Uh, of course, she didn't look normal in the face or anything, but, uh, you know, she was more human-like than what this soldier was, that I call it. And the first thing she did was grab me by the cheek and pinch my skin and then take her fingers and run down my throat and try to come up through my nasal cavity. And that's when I started bleeding and you know, you losing my breath and all. And uh, it was just like she told me, you know, but her mouth didn't move. But she just put this thought in my head, we're not going to hurt you. It's okay. And then she backed up a little bit. So it was just a telepathic, almost like thought you knew it was coming from her. Uh, yeah, I just, just knew it did. It wasn't because her mouth moved or anything. But it was just a telepathic thought. Now, something else when we went in, there's something come out of the ceiling about the size of a deck of cards, and it stopped about a foot before it got to my head, and it made a clicking noise. Then it went to the side of my head, to the right, and it made another clicking noise. Then behind my head, and then to the left of my head, and then it went straight back in the ceiling, and I figured that was some kind of a MRE or MRI or something like they do more or less today. Now, I don't know the purpose of all of it, but I figured it's something medical. And I think that this that examined me was more like a doctor than anything, and she just wanted to examine us and see what was going on. So in the back of my mind, I was used for an experiment or like they used to experiment on animals around here. But after uh, she telepathically sent that thought, she backed up out of the way, and the old big robotic creature, ugly one, he came back in because I was starting to kind of come out of my trance a little bit, get to where I could move, grab me by the arm. But when he did, I felt a uh, like a puncher. And then later on at the examination at the hospital, they said it was one. So I figure he injected something in me to kind of settle me down. And that's when he picked me up, carried me back outside, set me down on the river, facing the river, my arms stretched out. And the next thing I knew, I heard Charlie, Calvin, Calvin, you okay? And uh, I turned around and looked, and that, the craft, the light, the bright light just disappeared. I figured that's the door closing. And it just picked up, went straight up into the air and disappeared real quick. So we sat around a little while to try and figure out what to do. Of course, I was wanting to go ahead and get out of there. Charlie said, no, wait a minute. Let's sit down here. And uh, we sat down and we talked about it for a few minutes. I said, look, Charlie, he wanted to call somebody. And, of course, it wasn't pay phones then, so you had to go to a phone. I mean, it wasn't cell phones. What did they do to him? So, was it similar to what happened to you, or was there anything different? Uh, because, obviously, you know, he, he told you his experience, I imagine. No, I never asked a man. He never told me. We never really talked about our experience. Okay, now, so he it was, was more of a panic, like, what do we do? Like, do we tell the police? Yeah. Do we go home? Do you think we've been infected with something? Right. Now, I was worried about being uh, some kind of, because they didn't look real healthy to me, and I was worried about getting some kind of a disease, airborne disease or something, or maybe radiation. 
And I brought that up when we were sitting there. Charlie, we need to go get checked. If we do anything, need to go to the hospital. And uh, he said, don't worry about that. So he never was really concerned about none of that until later on when I brought it up uh, the next day to uh, the sheriff's department. Then they got kind of worried about their cell. But, uh, so you eventually called out. the sheriffs. Oh, yeah. We left there. When we sat down and talked, I said, Charlie, I don't want nobody to know. I'm going to get married in a month. I don't. I don't want to have to explain all this bull back home. And, uh, well, we're not going to tell nobody. But we got up, went to the car. I had trouble cranking the car. It was a brand new car. The window was shattered on the passenger side. All the windows on that side shattered in place. Finally got the car cranked. We went to the store, and that's when Charlie... Why were the windows shattered? Was that from the vibration of the craft or something? It had to be because uh, we was parked probably 100 foot from where the craft landed, and it was facing the craft. The car was pretty much parallel with the, with the craft that landed there. And I figured it's kind of like these Opry singers that can break glass with their voice. I figured there was a high enough pitch in here to shatter the windows in place. Plus, it messed the electrical system of the car up. Okay, so but the we new got, car wasn't very new after that. No, uh huh. And uh, I was really upset about all that, and I get into that a little later because uh, the sheriff department then made a report on it. I could have turned it over to insurance. But uh, we left there, and we went to a little Magic Mart store, and uh, they had a payphone outside. Now, in the state of Mississippi in the 70s, 6 o'clock in the evening, the streets roll up. Nothing's open because they have blue laws. So you're not going to find a store or nothing open if you uh, wanted to go in one. But they did have payphones on the outside, and that's where Charlie called Keesler Air Force Base first, and they told him to call the local authorities because they didn't deal with nothing like that anymore. So Charlie called uh, the sheriff department. They said, y'all wait right there. And it wasn't just a few minutes. They pulled up in a patrol car and uh, looked in, give us a field sobriety test to see if we'd been drinking, and... Uh, told us to follow them to the sheriff department. So we followed there, and they followed up more on uh, the drinking to see, see if we'd been drinking, and they proved we hadn't. And uh, they took Charlie into a interrogation room. They took myself into an interrogation room and uh, interrogated us. Then they put us into a room together and left out. But little did I know at this time, they had a tape recorder in one of the drawers in that room so they could listen in on what we was talking about. And I know what they thought. We'd get in there and say, tell them, you know, we got one over on them or something like that. But that wasn't the case. So they came back in in just a few minutes, took the tape recorder out, and walked into another room. Now, we, I still didn't know there was a tape recorder. They listened to it. That's when they called the big sheriff to come in. And uh, he was just stunned. He didn't, because of the reactions, the way we was acting on the tape. And he come in there and he told us, he said, y'all can go home. He said, I want to tell y'all, if this had been a hoax, she was going to jail for a long time. But I believe it's something to this. Y'all go home. We'll see. We'll talk about it tomorrow. So that's when we left and went home. Then we got up the next morning at 7 o'clock and come on back into work. Uh, when we got to work, to the place where we worked, that's when I noticed cars that had never been there before, never have I seen in my life. That place was flooded with the news media. There was cameras set up outside in the yard and all. 
I didn't know what was going on. I thought it was maybe some kind of special event the shipyard was having. I didn't know that was there for Charlie and I. But uh, we went ahead and made it to the gate. We got brassed in, went on to our workstations. And it wasn't just a minute. They sent somebody from the office to pick us up and bring us back to the office. And we got in there, and the owner of the shipyard come in. He said, we cannot conduct business. What's going on? And I was thinking, well, why in the world is he telling us this? He said, the press is here because something happened to y'all, you two, last night. And uh, they want to interview. And the phones is ringing. We can't even conduct our business because of the phones ringing the way they are. So uh, I thought, uh uh-oh. And sat back and thought just a minute. They said, we got our company lawyer coming over. He's going to give a press release. And then y'all going to the uh, hospital and get checked out. Then you're going to Keesler Air Force Base and be checked for radiation. And, and that's what happened. They come down, they gave us a press release, or he gave a press release. He escorted us with the Sheriff's Department to the hospital. They did a thorough examination, blood work and everything. And they decided that the punchers on us could have been an injection that uh, I had on my arms, you know, where we kind of settled down. Then they took us to Keesler Air Force Base, and they checked us for radiation. When we pulled up, we didn't even, it was an Air Force Base. We didn't even have to stop at the gate. They just had an escort, and escorted us right on up to the building. And there was four or five guys out there in these hazmat suits. They checked us for radiation. Then when that was over, one of them hollered all clear, and they said, well, they want to see you inside. So they had a a guard escort us down to a uh, conference room, and it was a lot of the local, uh, and why they did this, I don't know, how the local police departments, uh, the mayors, all the staff of the uh, service are, high-ranking military officers, and I was in there. And we had to explain to them what went on. And they did like a a news interview with us, I guess, for a press release. And they was real nice and courteous and told us we could go. So we went back out, got in the patrol car, and that's when we went back to our workstation. And... uh, they told us that Dr. Uh, John Anaheimick was on his way down and he wanted to see us in the morning for us to be back at the shipyard in the morning. And that's when they had the press set up for their big press release at the shipyard. And sure enough, good to the word, Dr. Heinick and Dr. John Allen Harder was at the uh, shipyard waiting, waiting to talk to Charlie and I. And they did a pretty intent interview with the both of us. And uh, they had already been out to the uh, place where this happened. And that's another thing I don't understand. And back then, well, I do, it being back when this happened. You know, because there was no, uh, there was three TV stations on the TV. It was ABC, NBC, and CBS. Nobody ever talked about it. I didn't even know what a UFO was. Uh, oh, nobody yeah, of course, talked about it. because there's no re- internet either, and news didn't travel fast. No, sir. No cell phones, no internet, three TV stations. You had three old geezers that's been there for 100 years on TV that did the news, and unless you was a president of the United States, nothing got broke into so the news media was really starving for news. And that's one reason that uh, I think it went over so big because there wasn't any news back in. The biggest thing, you know, that we had just went through was Watergate or something like that. So 
anyhow, they should have taped off the site where this happened because I'm sure there was evidence left there, but they didn't. Uh, Dr. Uh, Heineck went down and he searched the site and he actually had reports on everything that went on, what he found. Now, I, I didn't get to see his reports and uh, the only thing he said to me is that, or he gave a press release, he said, I believe these guys are legitimate. If they acted, they should be in Hollywood because they're good actors. He said, I believe them. Right, and, and uh, your friend had been in uh, the North Korean War and seen action, and apparently, from what I understand, he was quite traumatized by the experience as well. Yeah, and you know, North Korea was a pretty tough battle for their people. It was cold, they starved, and uh, I've heard stories. Now, me and him never talked about it, but I've heard stories since then about what the man went through in North Korea. And if you was battle-driven back then, you was kind of a hard-ass. But, uh, but you are in a situation where you had no control over what was happening to you, and... These are beings from you don't know where coming down. And right. You're, I guess you're lucky that you are alive and they decided to uh, to let, to let release you after whatever they did. Yes, sir. Uh, you were, like I say, I don't care how bad that you would be or if you was even harmed, I don't believe it was nothing you could do about it. We just had to go along with what they wanted. And, uh, cause I know the next day at the, uh, shipyard, some of the men, they all had their rifles or guns or pistols and they was fixing to get in their boats at night and go hunting these things, which, you know, that was ridiculous. I knew they was already young. And I told them, I said, you fellas better not, if you find them, you better not shoot them, shoot at them. Cause you, I feel like you'll pay for this if you do. But uh, that was just the mentality of the Mississippi rednecks back in, you know. If you can't, if you can't uh, fix it, then you shoot it. So that, that's pretty much the way they felt. And what were the other sightings? I guess people in the town saw strange lights in the sky that night. What were some of the other reports that, that had come in that collaborated what you and your friend went through? We actually had a uh, parole officer that was going across the bridge that night, and he seen it, so that would put law enforcement there. There was a preacher that seen the craft when it picked up off the ground of one of the churches in uh, Pasquagula, and he seen the craft leaving. And then there was uh, a guy from, uh, a preacher from Greece that seen the, uh, things in the sky that, uh, you know, while he was coming across the bridge. So we have that many witnesses. Then there was some of the local people that lived around that seen it. And some of them just came out in 73 at the book signing. And, you know, you want to think in the back of your mind that people wouldn't uh, tell you a story about something like that if it didn't happen. And I really believe these people. Because, uh, you know, we was with my, there, it was stories like, we was with our mom and dad and we seen this and we was standing in the backyard. We know this happened. And we just waited to see you to tell about it. Because I had completely disappeared out of the public eye. I didn't want nothing to do with any of this. Now, Charles Hickson took a different story, took a different path than I did. He made every public talk show, every public event. Uh, he wrote a book. I got a copy of his book. I never read it because I didn't want nothing to do with all this. And then why I decided to do the book when I did, like I say, the news media. My wife and I was at a uh, wake one night, and I signed a register. Now, this was 45 years later. And I signed the register, and somebody recognized my name on the register. That's how far, you know, the memory of the, 
a lot of people right here about this story. And they asked me, are you the Calvin Parker? I said, well, I guess I am the Calvin Parker. They said, no, the one that got abducted in 73. I said, yeah. I said, but look, this isn't the place to talk about this. Uh, this man has a family in here, and they grieve it. And all these people standing around me wanting to hear the story. So I told my wife, let's get out of here. And on the way home, she said, look, you've never talked to me about this. We've been married 45 years. You never talked to me about any of this. You never told your friends about none of this. You never said nothing to nobody about it. None of the families ever asked you about it because they always thought that was a personal deal. And she was telling the truth there. You know, I never had talked about it. Nobody's asked me about it. Everybody just kept it quiet. So she said, why don't you write a book and tell your story? Well, I don't have much of an education, but I told her, I said, okay, you know, just to get her off my back. I said, I'll find a ghostwriter and we'll write it. Knowing that I wasn't going to look for a ghostwriter or would never find one probably if I did. But it just so happened that the next day my phone was ringing and it was Philip Mantle. And uh, he had some questions he wanted to ask me about Charlie's book. Now, he's the publisher of my book, The Flying Disc, in the U.K. there. And uh, he had some questions that he wanted to ask me about Charlie's book. And I told him, I said, you know, I don't really want, I don't know nothing about Charlie's book. I don't even have a copy of it. He said, really? He said, I want to ask you stuff. I said, I don't want to talk about it. He, I said, I got enough problems on my own. I explained to him what happened at the uh, wake the day before. He said, why don't you, uh, why don't you write your own book? You put it, you, you, uh, it's your legacy. You put it down. Nobody can change your story then. It's black and white. And uh, you write that, then it speaks for itself. You can do away with these interviews. Just tell them to buy the book. And that made a lot of sense to me. And I said, well, let me think about it. I've been kicking around writing a book. I said, I'll get back to you. Well, we hung the phone up. And I had never had intentions on getting back with him about a book. I just said that to get him off my back and uh, keep my wife's mouth shut. So it wasn't a week later the phone rung and I picked it up. It was Philip again. Well, between Philip and my wife, they talked me into it. I said, well, I don't have nothing but just a few notes that I had taken down trying to remember stuff, Philip. And that was the truth because during the Hurricane Katrina, you know, we lost our, everything. We had eight foot of water in the house. So, you know, we didn't have no records or nothing that survived all that. But just my memory where I had just jotted down. Again, he said, well, send them to me. Let me see them. And uh, I guess he was thinking I was right, had a manuscript or something. I was right. I sent them to him. The next day, he sent them back. He said, that's quite a mess. He said, we got a lot of work to do to get this book out if you want to write a book. I said, Philip, I got a, don't have an education. I don't know anything about it. I said, but one thing I do know is what happened to me. I know I've never shared it. I've got a lot of pressure on me, people wanting to hear about it. And I said, the people that I know and the people that live around here, especially, deserve to hear about this. I said, I'll try. I said, with your help, I'll try it. And uh, that's when I started putting the book together. Of course, I went and bought a computer so I would have spell check on the computer because, again, I didn't know how to spell, so, you know, I just needed some help with it. And I sent him the first chapter, and he sent me an outline, chapter to chapter, what I needed to do. Like, chapter one needs to be introduce yourself, how you meant chapter two, how you meant Charlie, chapter three, the encounter, and then the aftermath was after that. And that's kind of the outline I took. And Philip has been a real champ through all this. He uh, 
I mean, I couldn't. There would be no book if it hadn't been for Philip Mantle. So I wrote the book, and I told him, I said, Philip, the only way I'm doing this, I know I'm a redneck. I know I don't know literature. I know I don't know how to write a book, and I don't really care. I said, the only way I'm going to do this, if nothing has changed in this book, nothing's edited, the way I give you this book is raw, and that's the way I want it to stay. And he said, well, you don't want to edit it. I said, no, sir, I do not want to edit this book. I want it raw. And we had that agreement up front. Now, he's took a little flack over that, but, uh, you know, it's really worked out. The people that's read the book said it's like sitting in the living room with you and you telling the story. And you did, uh, you did pass a lie detector test regarding this, from what I understand, and I think there's some other documentation in the book that helps support everything that you went through. Is that right? Yes, sir. Now, I, got, I have to say Philip was good with coming up with documentation. Uh, we have a lie detector test, a boy stress test, went under hypnosis, uh, went through some kind of other little truth test they was coming out with, uh, where they hook electricity to you and you lie, it shocks you. And, uh, and it's a pretty good shot because they tell you to tell them a lie. It put put a pretty good joke into you. Now, I didn't put this one in the book. I just, when you mentioned lie detector test, I just thought of it, how painful this thing was <laughs> for to tell a lie. And I wish I had one here. I'd like to hook it to people when they walk in the door. But, yeah, Philip did really good about documenting. Uh, while I was writing the book on my story, he was putting together all these articles that come out of all over the world where it happened, all the documentation, all the proof, he was able to get uh, the manuscripts from the secret tapes of the sheriff department. And one more thing he got that really surprised me, I had mentioned to Philip, I said, you know, I met Bud Hopkins one time. I had some missing time. And I got to meet uh, a friend of mine took me to see Bud Hopkins because he had wrote a book on missing times. And Bud tried to hypnotize me. And I don't believe he ever hypnotized me. He said, oh, I know Bud very well. I said, well, you know, I, good. You call him up and talk to him see if I was hypnotized. He said, Bud passed away a pretty good while back. I said, well, I hate to hear that because I did like Bud Hopkins. And uh, he said, let me see if I can get a hold of uh, his notes from that. Now, I never thought Bud hypnotized me, but Philip was able to get, he called Dr. Jacobs, and uh, Dr. Jacobs had all his information and all, and he uh, sent the tape where he, Dr. Jacobs called me and asked if I, he had his permission to send that tape to Philip. I said, certainly you do. But I had still had no idea I was hypnotized. And Philip got the tape and he wrote it in the book. You know, he transcribed it out in the book. Now we have a copy of the disc. But um, he transcribed it. And when he sent it to me over the computer, you know, in a format there for me to read, I couldn't even read it because I was so shocked that I was uh, hypnotized. I didn't know it, but what he had done was put a post-hypnotic suggestion in my head that I only would remember the things that I could handle and wanted to remember when the time got ready. And up until he did this, I know I, I walked out on the, read some of it, and I walked out on the porch and I told my wife, I said, you know, you remember when we seen Bud Hopkins and he said he hypnotized me? Or we went to get hypnotized and said, yeah. I said, he hypnotized me. There's probably a two or three hour session here. Wow. And that was shocking to me. So there's a lot of uh, things that collaborate uh, your story in this. And of course, you're probably not making that much money on the book, but 
this is the first thing you've put out in all these years that actually could make money. So initially, when you when this story came out, uh, there was no benefit to you because you didn't actually like being recognized um, for this. Exactly right. I don't, you know, and, and it's. Uh, I don't think anyone in the UFO industry really makes it. Uh, you, what do they call them, you are, ufologists or whatever they call them, yeah, you, that write books and do things like that. It's not any money in that. Uh, most of my work, 99% of my work now, uh, I had a book signing down here in Pascagoula, and, uh, you know, I got to talk to the people and meet the people. And about 99% of my work is more or less like going around and meeting people and doing favors for other people. Now, it's like Pascagoula has put together a uh, fund to help the city, and I go and sign, do book signings and all, and they sell books. And I just get a little bit off every book. It's, it's not a whole lot. Now, it could possibly, we've got things working, and I'm not in this for the money. Because my living's made, I'm retired, and uh, but we have things making that could possibly make a little bit. Now, like everybody says, well, you on the radio or you're on TV every day. I said, yeah, I am usually two or three times a day. I said, but keep in mind, they don't send Calvin Parker a check for getting on the radio or do it. news. Don't pay for news. I said, this news, that's what it is. And I don't want to charge for what I'm doing like this. Where a lot of people, and I told Philip, I'm going to make the, the, the circuit on the conference uh, this year because I've never had been to these conferences and I'm kind of looking forward to going. And uh, But I'm not going to do like a lot of these people do I'm, I'm not going to make a career out of going to these things every year. This year, when October hits to this year, October the 11th, I got one more book signing that I've agreed to do, and then I'm going off grid. I got a houseboat. I'll be on that, and they won't be but one way to get a hold of me, and that's getting a boat and come out in this river <laughs> somewhere or the ocean and find me. And that that's the way I want to live life. I got a big house. I'm going to get rid of this house. And I'm getting on this houseboat, and I won't need electricity or the way I've got it set up or nothing. I don't want a cell phone on it. I might have a radio, a VHF radio. So if somebody wants to get a hold of me or want to talk about this, they better do it between now and October of this year. And I agreed. That's one thing I did agree on with Philip that I would make the circle and, uh, you know, the 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 conferences and things like that and help promote the book, but October's the end of my contract. And what do you think now that uh, the internet's out there and YouTube? There's lots. Of course, there's some fake videos out there, but there seems to be a lot of very unexplainable uh, UFO videos coming out all the time. Do you think? It's more. It's getting more accepted in mainstream culture now, and it's less of a joke than it uh, was in past decades. I feel like it's no doubt about it. I feel like that sooner or later somebody is going to get the evidence that they need, and it will go all across the world immediately because of the internet. You can get on this thing and see anything. I was talking to a, a reporter that interviewed me, Doug. He's a local reporter here for ABC News. And he said, you know, after Katrina, I thought the highlight of my career would be going to Washington and talking to the president when they was trying to appropriate funds for down here. And I thought that would be the highlight of my career. But when I got back home, he said, you know what the highlight was, what got more interest than anything I've ever done? I said, what was that, Doug? He said, one of these rednecks in Van Clee, Mississippi, which is just right over Fasbergula here, had a deer cam out in the woods, and they got pictures of UFOs on this deer cam, and it hit the Internet, and it's exploded. It's all over. And he said, that got more attention than what it 
what I did going to Washington. I said, so I guess the deer cam is a highlight of my career. And it is a matter of not just national but international security. Um, if these things are in our airspace, we don't know if maybe they are from Earth, from an enemy country, or probably they're not. Probably they're from somewhere else, but this is kind of a dangerous thing if, if these things are in our airspace and they're undetected. Oh, it is. And it, it's something that will, uh, you know, sooner or later, some, something's going to have to happen. Now, personally, I feel like they might travel now. Uh, you know, used to, you, it, it was a big thing. You, I was looking back, you'd hear of a UFO regular. But now I think they kind of travel interdimensional. So, uh, you know, it, it's it's a big deal. It is national security. Well, and that's we, one reason they keep it quiet. Yeah, because they say that they're not interested. I know in Canada, the government said, and the government has actually admitted that there's more sightings but they say they're not going to investigate it themselves. They're going to leave it up to people to privately investigate it. But I would find no matter what it is, if we don't know what it is and it's in our airspace, that is very dangerous for sure. We want to know what's in our airspace. But. Exactly right. There's so much interest in this right now. And it's more and more, you know, you have the History Channel that's showing this ancient alien. And actually, some of the stuff they talk about makes a lot of sense. You know, up until I wrote the book, I didn't pay no attention to this. I just figured it was a bunch of people that wanted their five minutes. And, and I feel like some of them are. But I made a point to go see Betty at Betty Hill. I flew up and uh, interviewed her. And i tell you why. She... And her husband, Barney, Betty and Barney Hill, had a sighting in the uh, 60s. And, you know, it was a pretty big deal back then. But you know what convinced me it was true? It wasn't the sighting they had or the evidence they had. They were a mixed couple. And back then, a white woman didn't marry a black man and get away with it. You know, it just wasn't heard of. And I said, you know, if they put that much publicity on herself is uh, deep set is hard against what people are against that right now. It's got to be something to it. And I got to go, I spent three, four days at her house, and she is a great person, a lovely person. And we talked, and uh, she asked me a lot of questions. I did her. And we even went up into the mountains where they had their sighting. And, and uh, she said that every now and then she goes up there and looks and she sees something. I, I don't know. But, you know, it, it was, that was good therapy for me to go see her. But that, that was the reason I really believed her because she wouldn't put that much pressure on herself, not in the 60s, if that hadn't happened. So in the end, do you consider yourself kind of unique for having this experience and you're not that upset about it anymore, or is this still something that traumatizes you and you'd rather that it never happened to you and it, the, the pain and suffering you've been through isn't worth the experience? Well, I had rather it not happen, but the older a person gets, the better they learn to deal with things. And... Uh, that's the situation I'm in. You know, I had to learn to deal with it because I didn't want to die and take us to the grave and people not know really what happened to me. I had a friend, and we were sitting over there on his uh, porch drinking a cold beer, to be honest with you. And he said, where have you been, Calvin? I said, oh, I've been writing a book. He said, what you been writing a book about? Well, I told him. He said, you know, we fished together. He said, you know, we've told each other many a lies, but you never lied to me about this because you never talked to, to me about it. So uh, that's when I knew I was doing the right thing. Plus, my wife, 
She had no idea. I have a daughter. She had no idea. Uh, I had a certain group of friends, and it's not that many of them because I didn't trust too many people, but the friends that I had, about six or seven of them, we all have boats. We all love to fish. We all live on the river. Most all, uh, one of them had about a million dollar houseboat down here. And during the uh, summer, we'd all come down. We'd get on a houseboat. We'd cook. We'd barbecue. We'd visit. We all go fish our separate ways. Then during the winter, we'd go our separate ways, and wouldn't nobody hear from nothing unless somebody needed something. But if one of us needed something, we all put it, pulled together and and done it. My house flooded. One of them gave me the tile. I didn't have insurance at the time. One of them uh, had a mobile home park. He sold mobile homes and all. He said, look, he said, I got a bunch of tile in storage. Come get it. I didn't want to do it. He said, no, come get it. Well, I got it, brought it in, fixed it, and put it down. Well, I got a friend that owns a construction company. And I speak about all of them in the book. And I have a friend that owns a construction company. And he sent crews over to help put this down. I mean, that's just the kind of friends we are. And when they needed help, I was there for them. And you can do that with just a few friends. And it's not, uh, and you know, Facebook's great to get out and meet people and chat and talk about things. Yeah, and you're on that for people that want to that want to follow you. They can uh, look you up, Calvin Parker, on Facebook. Just to throw that out there for our listeners. Right, and uh, you know I do this because there's a few people that want to keep up with what's going on with this, and I try to get on it every day, and I try. You know, I speak to, I will speak to a few people every day on Facebook. And uh, if somebody emails me or writes me, I'll answer them. And I try to keep everybody in the loop of what's happening. Because I didn't write the book for me. I wrote it for everybody. And that's just the way that I feel about it. And what I'm trying to do with this is make it easier on somebody else that might have a, uh, a sighting or an abduction. And let them know how to go about handling this a little better than what I did. There was no schooling back when I did this. Nobody knew how to handle things. Now somebody asks, what do I do? Well, the first thing you do is get to a safe place. Call the law enforcement. Let them check it like a crime scene. And that's what it is, a crime scene. And then document everything that you've seen while you're thinking about it. Get something, write it all down, or get a tape recorder. If you get, everybody has cell phones now, it's no reason not to get pictures anymore if you can. And it's just things that's coming forward now that a person could do that they couldn't do back in the day that that it happened to me. I mean, number one, nobody would nobody ever heard of UFOs or aliens, so they you know or they didn't know what to do matter. about it. There were right. no books on abductions. Uh, you might find a fiction book on aliens if you'd searched in the library, but yeah, but the law enforcement didn't know how to uh, to handle it, and actually they made it harder on the person that got abducted than uh, what the aliens would. The time it was all over, and and the news media, most of them is just glorified idiots now. And I, I don't mind saying that, but it's the truth. You know, they won't tell the news like it is. And that's the only place that Donald Trump and I meet eye to eye. And I, I don't get into politics at all. But uh, I've heard him talking about fake news and stuff. But I, I can relate to him on that. Well, anyone that's been in the news or any type of public figure knows a little bit about how people spin the news and uh, details that are left out a lot of the times. But did any ufologist or alien expert speculate on what type of species of aliens it may have been that you encountered? Because obviously we know about the gr there's a gray species, which are more of the classic species, and then we've heard that there's like a tall white 
type species of alien, but I never really, yours is kind of unique, so I was just curious if anyone tried to speculate of possibly a, a name of that type of alien species that you may have encountered. No, uh, nobody ever has. I've been meaning, you know, uh, Philip, the publisher of the book, he, uh, he's a you ufologist, whatever they call him. And the only thing I ever heard him say about it, and he was saying it to a guy, they're working on a uh, documentary now with this, and he said, well, look, Calvin, it was a unique encounter that he had with a unique uh, species. And that was the only thing he ever said. I would like to hear him on a show talk about it, or two or three uh two or three different ones yeah because a lot of people that aren't really that familiar with uh with the possibility of aliens they always assume there's only one species but the universe is so vast uh even there's not even one like people on earth are a lot different let alone uh beings from other planets or other galaxies they they all might have different intentions and the ones that you described are definitely unique. As you said, they may have been robots, but the crab-like hands I think you described, I never heard of the of anyone else describe encountering uh, aliens li like that. So it, it's a very interesting and unique story. And I haven't uh, ordered your book yet, but I will definitely uh, order your book. And it is available on Amazon. Do you want to remind people how to the different ways they could purchase your book as far as I know Amazon is uh, the best way to get it right now and it's also out in audio and Kindle through Amazon uh, I don't I don't even think Philip sends out copies you know if it's to lot for book signings and things with a flying disc but Amazon's the closest way to get it Paspagula the closest encounter, my story, Calvin Parker. Well, I really appreciate that you uh, took the time to speak with us, and I'm happy that you came out with the uh, full documentation of your story because it's obviously important to, to get these type of incidents documented, and yours seems very credible. You went through the right chains, as you've mentioned, and the police even tested you, and especially in those days. You're not going to suspect a room is bugged when you leave the room. And no. Uh, plus, they did something else that I was glad of. The, they checked us for drugs and drinking and all that. And I, I, I'm glad they done it now. Back in, you know, it, it really didn't matter to me. But... Uh, it's a good thing they've done that because I helped put a little uh, credi credibility into the book. And anything I could do to get the credibility. And that's like I told somebody, if you don't believe it, buy the book, read it. The evidence is in there to stand up in a court of law of this thing. went. If it ever went to a, a judge in a court of law like it was a criminal, you know, the evidence is there to back everything up. And... You got eyewitnesses, you got voice stress tests, you got polygraph tests, you got everything in there. And finally, to close this interview off, is, is there anything you want to say to our listeners about your book and any final message? No, I, I, I would just like to get the book out there and let everybody read it because it's going to help some people sometime. If it just helps one person know how to deal with something like this, it'll be worth it. Excellent. So. Well, thanks again for, for sharing your story with us, and I will definitely stay in contact with you, and it was a pleasure to speak with you. Good deal. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Great North Wrestling Podcast. Subscribe to this podcast on iTunes and subscribe to the Hannibal TV on YouTube for all the latest GNW news and videos. Follow at 
Devin Hannibal on Twitter and check out our website at thehannibaltv.com. <laughs>